Coming up in ViewCast, amazing Vanderbilt research you have to see to believe. How this robot lets paraplegics walk. And how winning a football game could influence who wins the presidency. Hi, I'm Amy Wolf with ViewCast. It's a traumatic diagnosis. You're paralyzed from the waist down after a car wreck or other injury. Some 270,000 people in the United States have spinal cord injuries, and more than 150,000 are paraplegics. But now, thanks to a wearable robot developed by Vanderbilt University researchers, some paraplegics can walk again. ViewCast Barb Kramer takes us on one man's emotional journey. This is not where Brian Schaefer ever thought he would be. Needing extra time and effort just to get out of his pickup truck. But it's the only way for Brian to get around now. Just a few years ago, Brian was playing football in high school and college, enjoying life with his wife Kendra and their four children. But Christmas night 2010, life changed drastically. Coming over an overpass, I hit some ice and flipped my, my vehicle. Um, I just knew that when I tried to get out of the vehicle, all I could do was drag myself out backwards. So I knew that I couldn't stand up or move my legs at that point. I knew something was pretty serious that happened. What's happening? The complete spinal cord injury left Brian paralyzed from the waist down. One, two, three. But now Brian is working with Vanderbilt researchers led by Michael Goldfarb on a new robotic device. Called an exoskeleton, it attaches above Brian's hips and to his legs. Everything feels pretty good. One, two, three. There we go. Electric motors at both hip joints and both knee joints are powered by small lithium batteries and controlled by microcomputers. The microcomputers talk to each other and basically tell the legs to, to move forward and they command that through the, the, uh, the motors in the leg. It's Brian's first time up for a few weeks. The crutches help only with stability. To activate movement, Brian uses hip placement. It's a pretty easy movement, you know. You just lean, in, lean into the left a little, put your weight, lean to the right, and it's gonna take another step. And with even more practice, Brian should be able to make advanced moves like this patient. There we go. Along with social and psychological benefits, Dr. Goldfarb says the exoskeleton helps the body. One of the things this does is, is gives, the, the, just being able to walk around for 30 minutes a day uh, addresses uh, a lot of these secondary issues. Bone density reduces muscle spasticity, uh, improves uh, skin conditions, uh, improves peripheral circulation. Goldfarb says the legged Segway will not replace a wheelchair. It will just take disabled people where a wheelchair can't go. Researchers have signed an agreement with Parker Hannafin to commercially produce the device and hope to have it available to the public in 2014. I mean, just being able to actually stand up after four, five, six months of not standing up, that's, that's wonderful. Brian says the exoskeleton is comfortable and doesn't tire him at all. The device fits in a wheelchair and snaps apart for easy transportation. For Brian, he is just ready to walk again. Yeah, I, I, see, it. I see myself walking one day. is I'd like to be able to have these legs on, you know, get out of my vehicle or get out of my chair and be able to stand up against the fence and watch, watch my son play ball. I would love to do that. I would love to do that. For ViewCast, Barb Kramer reporting. This exoskeleton is the only device of its kind with electrical stimulation for some patients. This could help stroke victims relearn how to use their muscles to walk. The device is funded through a grant from the National Institutes of Health and tested by the Shepherd Rehab Hospital.
And they're going to toss it to Tate running right. He'll cut up field, gets to the 20, gets to the 15, gets to the 10, gets to the corner, gets to the end zone. Touchdown, Commodores! Two receivers to the left. They fake with play action. Now throwing back to the left all by himself is Chris Cantera, and he'll get the end zone. Touchdown, Commodores! This weekend, we welcome over 4,000 alumni from 12 undergraduate reunion classes. Over the past year, these alumni have supported Vanderbilt by making gifts in honor of their reunion. And the grand total, drum roll please, the total, $21,745,513. Thank you, Vanderbilt alumni. Uh, I think it's a real testament to Vanderbilt's amazing success on the athletic field on the campus and in the community in our great nation. And we couldn't be happier. Couldn't be happier and more proud. And he'll keep Rogers left to the goal line touchdown. Play action, rolling right as Rogers buying time, looking to the end zone, Chris Boyd touchdown. Since we're deep in football season right now and in the middle of electing our next president, here's a double dip for you. What influence do you think a winning sports team has on who wins an election? A Vanderbilt political economist who studies voter behavior finds something seemingly irrelevant to politics, like a successful college football or basketball team, does impact the ballot box. Cecilia Moe and her co-author studied whether college football and basketball games played the week of elections affected the choices voters made. They found a win by the local college team raised the number of votes going to the incumbent by about one and a half to three percentage points. There's a great article on this on Slate.com. Search Cecilia Mo and football. For ViewCast, I'm Amy Wool.